Good morning, everyone. Welcome back to our four-part webinar series, Communicating Climate Change as a Public Health Issue. My name is Kathleen Carley. I'm a division manager with the San Luis Obispo County Public Health Department. Uh, a brief acknowledgement, we'd like to thank our partners at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, um, who helped sponsor our webinar series through the Building Resistance Against Climate Effects BRACE program, which is a community of practice for communications and engagement. Our topic today is climate change and health equity, telling the story with data. Um, as in previous webinars, we're going to keep everyone on mute. Um, we will save our questions to the end. Um, we will have uh, about a 20 minute question and answer session at the end. And uh, my boss, Dr. Penny Borenstein, will help moderate the question and answer session with Linda Helland from the California Department of Public Health. Um, this series is being recorded and will be posted on our website. That's probably the most frequent question we've been getting. We have the first week already posted there. The second week will be posted before the end of this week. And about a week after each session is broadcast, it will be posted on our site, along with the PowerPoints we receive from the panelists. Um, our website is www.healslow.com. H-E-A-L-S-L-O dot com. Um, and um, so just check and, and everything will be there. Um, so now um, I think I've done my part and it's my pleasure to introduce Linda Helland, who is the team lead for the Climate Change and Health Equity Program of the California Department of Public Health's Office of Health Equity. The Climate Change and Health Equity Program embeds health and equity in California climate change policy and planning and embeds climate change and equity and public health policy and planning. The program works with local, state, and national partners to assure that climate change, mitigation, and adaptation activities have beneficial effects on health and foster equity. The program implements California's climate change laws and executive orders, contributing health equity consideration, and works to reduce vulnerability to climate impacts by improving living conditions with and for, and for people facing inequities. Before joining CDPH, Linda spent 14 years at Mendocino County Public Health as a senior program manager for the Prevention and Planning Unit where she led the unit to focus on health equity and root causes of health problems through policy systems and environmental changes to prevent illness before it starts. She is thrilled to do work that combines her two passions of health equity and climate change and loves riding her bicycle to the Richmond Public Health Campus. Linda, it's yours. Hold one second. Um, I'm gonna put up my slides here. Okay, it is such an honor to be here and to moderate this webinar and participate in the series, which I really enjoyed so far. As Kathleen said, this webinar is on climate change and health equity, telling the story with data. And we have some fantastic panelists for you. As you saw last week, climate change is threatening the resources we need to survive, including our air, water, food, and safety. It creates a variety of exposures and associated health risks, including increased heat, wildfires, and drought, smoke, worsened air quality and water quality, rising sea levels, allergens, flooding, workplace hazards, infectious food and vector-borne diseases, strains on healthcare systems and services, displacement, challenges to mental health and food insecurity. And while climate change touches everyone, research in climate events demonstrate that some people suffer worse health impacts from climate change than others. People with low incomes are less likely to have air conditioning to ride out heat waves and often lack automobiles to evacuate to safety in emergency events such as fires or floods. Communities of color are more likely to live with higher burdens of air pollution, the effects of which are more severe with higher temperatures, intensifying respiratory ailments. Elderly people and young children are most at risk for illness and death in extreme heat events, and others that are more vulnerable to health impacts of climate change include pregnant women, people with chronic diseases, disabilities or mental illness, immigrants, people facing homelessness, and tribal communities. Two of the biggest challenges we face are accelerating climate change and widening inequality, and they are connected. 
In our program, we recognize that climate change and health inequities have similar root causes, mainly the inequitable distribution of social, political, and economic power at the root of the tree you see here. Going up the trunk, these forces shape systems like healthcare, the economy, transportation, and housing, which in turn create the physical and social conditions, the branches of the tree, and the greenhouse gas emissions that drive both health, health outcomes and climate change, shown as the bitter fruit at the top. As a result, low-income communities and communities of color face both inequitable living conditions, such as living in areas with fewer parks and less, less tree canopy, disproportionate, Linda, Linda, yes. Can I interrupt uh -huh. you a second? We're yes. not seeing your PowerPoint. Is it supposed to be up there? Ah, yes, goodness. I'm sorry. Yeah, thank you for interrupting me. Thought I told it to share. Can you see it now? Now we can see it um, ah. there. much better. Thank you. OK. Yeah, thanks for telling me. I would have gone on. <laughs> there have been a couple slides so far. OK. <laughs> um, OK. We are here. Um, an example of uh, the, how these power inequities at the root of the tree lead to climate change and health inequities is that despite the fact that most Americans support a transition away from fossil fuels to renewable energy sources, there are still billions of dollars worth of subsidies given to fossil fuel companies. Fossil fuel extraction, processing, and infrastructure, including coal, gas, oil, storage, and transportation on trucks, ships, or rail, refining and burning, emits large amounts not only of greenhouse gases, but of other gases and air pollutants that cause health problems and early death. Finally, these facilities are cited disproportionately in low-income communities and communities of color, contributing to disproportionate and inequitable rates of cardiovascular disease, respiratory, and other ailments. This beautiful shade-giving tree represents the opportunity that climate change is offering us to remake our society at all levels. The capacity for resilience in the face of climate change is significantly driven by social and physical conditions and the systems that shape them, such as income, education, housing, transportation, environmental quality, and access to services such as healthcare, healthy foods, safe spaces for physical activity, and decision-making power. Thus, strategies such as alleviating poverty, increasing access to opportunity, violence prevention, increasing civic engagement, and reducing health and social inequities will result in more climate resilient communities. Fair and healthy climate resilience requires addressing the inequities that create and intensify community vulnerabilities through directing investments toward improving those conditions and increasing power for and with people facing inequities. If we approach our climate change work with a health, health and equity lens, we can not only slow and prepare for climate change, we can also achieve many of our other goals in the economy, education, health, and enjoy the many fruits of a society where all people have the opportunity to thrive. Our mission at the California Department of Public Health Office of Health Equity, which is where the Climate Change and Health Equity Program is housed, is to promote equitable social, economic, and environmental conditions to achieve optimal health, mental health, and well-being for all. Working to achieve health equity involves eliminating systemic and preventable differences in health status among groups that are associated with social disadvantage and unequal access to resources and opportunity. The state of health equity is full and equal access for all people to opportunities that enable them to lead healthy lives with a focus on improving conditions for those who've had fewer opportunities. Communities facing inequities have too often been excluded from the policies and processes that can be used to address climate change and support a transition to healthy, resilient, and sustainable communities. These communities have fewer resources to prepare for, adapt to, and recover from the effects of climate change. As a result, these communities are often the first and worst impacted by climate disruption and extreme weather events. To move towards equity requires an increase in resources to these communities to build and ensure their resilience. Investments, policies, and programs aimed at reducing disparities in training, employment, income, wealth, housing conditions, health, political empowerment, and preventing displacement will help to reduce communities' vulnerability to the impacts of climate change. Moreover, such investments and programs must do more than simply help vulnerable people bounce back from climate-related harms. Instead, they must support efforts to bounce forward to achieve full participation in an equitable, regenerative, and sustainable economy 
marked by inclusive engagement in decisions that affect daily life with adequate resources to thrive before, after, and despite climate change impacts. And to do all this, we need robust data every step of the way. Disaggregated and smaller scale data reveal the inequities we seek to correct in resources and living conditions. That data, in turn, should inform our resource allocation and prioritizing of people and places most in need of resources. Cal EnviroScreen that Gina Solomon will talk about today is one tool to spatially identify those inequities in toxic exposures, as well as population sensitivity indicators such as asthma, heart disease, and low birth weight babies, and socioeconomic indicators that can increase vulnerability to climate risks, including educational level, poverty, and unemployment. Nick Steinberg will show us maps that combine heat exposure risk with social vulnerabilities to help plan to protect people from heat illness. And as we invest in communities and make progress towards reducing their underlying vulnerability, we can use the resilience indicator, as Jackie Patterson will talk about, to measure changes in adaptive capacity and resilience. Jackie's work also demonstrates that people who have faced historical injustices know how to adapt and cope, having developed social networks, specialized skills and assets to overcome discriminatory policies and maintain their dignity. We can all learn from these resilience skills and data can help us prioritize resources to foster them deliberately. Jackie's work demonstrates how essential it is to engage community residents, especially those facing inequities in decisions and plans. As my colleagues in the climate justice movement say, nothing without us, nothing about us without us. Now I'd like to introduce our illustrious panel of speakers. I will introduce all three of them now so then we can move from one presentation to another. Jacqueline Patterson is the director of the NAACP Environmental and Climate Justice Program. Since 2007, Jackie has served as coordinator and co-founder of Women of Color United. She has worked as a researcher, program manager, coordinator, advocate, and activist, working on women's rights, violence against women, HIV and AIDS, racial justice, economic justice, emergency response, and environmental and climate justice. Jackie served as a senior women's rights policy analyst for Action Aid. Assistant Vice President of HIV AIDS Programs for IMA World Health, Outreach Associate for the Center on Budget and Policy Priorities, Research Coordinator for Johns Hopkins University, and as a U.S. Peace Corps volunteer in Jamaica, West Indies. Jackie's publications include Equity and Resilience, Building for Climate Adaptation and Indicators Document, Jobs versus Health, An Unnecessary Dilemma, Climate Change is a Civil Rights Issue, Gulf Oil Drilling Disaster, Gender Layers of Impact, Disasters, Climate Change, Uproot, Women of Color, and many more. Uh, Jackie holds a master's degree in social work from the University of Maryland and a master's in public health from Johns Hopkins. Gina Solomon is the Deputy Secretary for Science and Health at the California Environmental Protection Agency and a clinical professor of medicine at the University of California, San Francisco. At Cal EPA, Dr. Solomon serves as the science advisor to the secretary on a wide range of scientific issues related to chemical and pesticide health risk. Prior to coming to Cal EPA in 2012, she was a senior scientist at the Nas National Natural Resources Defense Council, the director of the Occupational and Environmental Medicine Residency at UCSF, and the co-director of the UCSF Pediatric Environmental Health Specialty Unit. Gina's work has spanned a wide variety of areas, including children's environmental health, reproductive toxicity, cumulative impacts, and evaluating the use of novel data streams to screen chemicals for toxicity. She has also done work in exposure science for air pollutants, pesticides, mold, and metals in soil and on the health effects of climate change. She was involved in the aftermath of Hurricane Katrina, the Gulf oil spill, and the Chevron Richmond explosion and fire, and is currently working to improve refinery process safety in California. Gina serves on the US EPA's Science Advisory Board and the Nat National Research Council's Board on Environmental Studies and Toxicology. She previously served on the Committees on to Toxicity Testing in the 21st Century and Exposure Science in the 21st Century, as well as on the National Toxicology Program Board of Scientific Counselors. She received her bachelor's from Brown University, her MD from Yale, and did her MPH on her residency and fellowship training in internal medicine and occupational and environmental medicine at Harvard. And Nick Steinberg, our last speaker, is a climate change impact modeler with deep expertise in climate and water-related risk. At 427, he leads the research team and guides the modeling efforts to assess the attributable impacts of climate change on human health. 
supply chains, infrastructure, and the natural environment. His primary research agenda is to distill complex system data for local decision making. As part of California's fourth climate change assessment, he's leading the development of a decision support tool that will help local planners and public health practitioners identify communities most vulnerable to future temperature extremes. Previously, Nick served as an environmental risk specialist in South Asia, the Middle East and North America, and Central and South America, conducting feasibility and impact evaluation for the US Agency for International Development, Millennium Challenge Corporation, National Aeronautics and Space Administration and Costa Rica's Environmental Sciences Services Payment Program. He holds a master's degree in natural resources and sustainable development from American University. Okay, Jackie, take it away. Great, can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay, good, so sharing screen. This will stop, okay, good. All right, so good afternoon, everyone. Um, I am, uh, yes, good. Hopefully you can see my presentation. So I'm going to quickly go through some of the, some of the social inequities that cause the health disparities in the context of climate change, and then quickly go to ex sharing some of the indicators that we've, came, we've come up with in order to do adaptation planning that is con considering the deep structural and systemic underpinnings of these inequities and really needing to, to as we as we do our planning, we need to be holistic in our thinking and systemic in our in our in our planning and our action. So, um, just sharing with you some of the some of the indicators that we came up with that we thought were, were pivotal to to being holistic and systemic. So, um, so I just uh, start with this quote from Martin Luther King: "I never intend to adjust myself to economic conditions that will take necessities from the many." to give luxuries to the few. And um, so really when we look at climate change, we look at the whole continuum of climate change because there are the drivers of climate change that disproportionately impact certain communities. And then there are the results of climate change that also disproportionately impact certain communities and populations, often the same communities and populations that have the, these various social vulnerabilities. So whether it's uh, coal mining that uh, has killed 76,000 coal miners since um, 1968, the fracking that where we have um, where we have people's water supplies being contaminated, or, or we have communities that are or states that are experiencing an uptick in in seismic activities as a result of, of, of fracking and in coal burning, which gets into the lungs and to into the waterways and into the soil of communities that are ho that are host to coal coal burning, which happens disproportionately in communities of coal and low-income communities. And this is just a, 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 a map of kind of how these um, toxins enter into the body and the impacts. So whether it's through water pollution, air pollution, or soil contamination, the impacts range from, from nerve damage to cardiovascular illness to respiratory illness to gastroenteritis and so forth and so on. And of course, we, we all know about the cancer clusters that result from some of the, the toxic areas that have, um, have developed across the country disproportionately, again, in communities of color and low-income communities. And so, and then this is just an example of a family that um, that gifted us with this uh, this image of living in the shadows of a coal-fired power plant in this in the southwest region, and the the health illness, the health impacts that they've had in their com their community as a result. While at the same time, they're actually not even benefiting from the electricity that is generated by the coal plant because 70% of the people on the lands in which they live do not have electricity. Or running water, and so this is the the very um, the very uh, kind of um, uh, let's see how am I saying the I, I, irony seems too mild, but but the the fact that they're suffering from the pollution um, from hosting five coal fired power plants within a 30 mile radius of where they live, but yet not actually even gaining from the benefit of the electricity that's generated from these plants, which go to to um, to power Phoenix and Las Vegas and so forth. So we see just some of the the deep um, injustices there with the, with that kind of situation. 
And so, and then we also see the other um, social impacts that of, of this kind of pollution exposure. Children who are experiencing asthma, African American children are more likely to live next to a coal fired power plant, also three to five times more likely to enter the has a hospital from asthma attack, and two to three times more likely to die of an asthma attack. And this affects their ability to, um, to go to school like other kids. Um, living next to a toxic facility lowers your property values, which, which also um, um, impacts your, the quality of your education. And then all of this in, impacts the extent to which you are on grade level by the third grade, which is shown to be the, the time where if you're not on grade level by the third grade, you're more likely to enter into the school to prison pipeline. When we also think about health impacts of climate change, we talk about the uh, shifts in agricultural yields. Um, and so whether, so the, often again, communities of color and low-income communities are already more likely to live in food insecure areas. Some people call them food deserts, but the communities don't actually don't like the term food deserts often because food deserts imply something that's, a desert implies something that's natural. Um, so deserts are a naturally occurring phenomenon. But we all know that the um, apartheid of um, resources is often is, is built on is based on historic systemic marginalization of certain communities that have been redlined or have, have experienced more modern day gentrification, but otherwise just being pushed out of areas where there actually are resources. So the shift in agricultural yields even just worsens the already existing food insecurity that happens in these communities. So they're more likely to get food out of the, a corner store than a farmer's market or a grocery store. So they're more likely to eat foods that are high in sodium, high in um, preservatives, high in sugars, which are foods that are not only not good for you, they're foods that are actively bad for you, which contribute to the proliferation of chronic illnesses that happen in these, in these various communities. So and then we see on the other side also the disasters um, that happen from the extreme weather. Um, so whether it's um, you know the hurricanes or other or the flooding that happens and again disproportionately um, affects communities of color and low-income communities who have various social vulnerabilities. And we'll talk about a little bit more when we talk about the indicators. And this is where we see kind of the marriage of those two. Um, just those exposures, whether, you know, folks uh, who are living in the shadows of, a, this is a uh, nuclear station in, in Mississippi called the Grand Gulf Nuclear Station. And again, all of these toxic facilities disproportionately located in low-income communities and communities of color. So when you have the increase in extreme weather events and that, that comes up against something like a toxic facility, then that even makes uh, brings more harm, potential harm to a community because if a nuclear reactor was breached when it's flooding or breached or damaged by a, by a, a hurricane or, or a tornado or whatever, then the communities there are the ones who would who would be suffering from whatever would result from um, from the the intersection between a toxic facility and a um, catastrophic event. So, and we also know that one of the major factors in the the, the loss of life in, during Hurricane Katrina was people didn't have transportation. They didn't have a way to get out when they when they, when they were told to leave and when they knew the storm was coming. So we had these dire rescue attempts, and then we had 1,800 people that weren't able to make it out. So they they died as a result. And then overlaid on this, we have other social vulnerabilities like people who are in prison. One thing that's little talked about in the aftermath of Hurricane Katrina was the fact that the deputies left their post um, in the prison that was there in Louisiana. And people literally were just left for days without food or water or ventilation. People had to break windows just to get some ventilation. Sewage tainted waters were rising up into the cells. No matter what anyone has done in, in, in their life or not done, because we all know about the racial profiling and false incarceration, particularly of communities of color, low income communities. But whether someone's guilty or not, they should never have to be in such inhumane circumstances because it's exactly what happened in the aftermath of this disaster. Then we have on the other side, uh, just illustrating you know, who's able to bounce back and who's most impacted. I was struck when I was in Alabama by the fact that people who were giving out the food after this disaster that happened there, down to a person who was white, white American, and every last person who was on the other side who was receiving food was African American. It just struck me in terms of who was who wasn't impacted in the first place or who was impacted but able to more quickly bounce back and be in a service position versus those who needed to be served. And similarly, 
it struck me just in terms of the systemic inequities, who was on the stage at the town hall meeting that was happening outside of that same venue, who was on the stage, who was in charge of the resources, who was in charge of the decision making, who's in charge of the services, down to a person, white American and mostly male, but then lined up at the mic, the three people who needed resources, who needed information, who needed services, down to a person, African American and female. Um, I won't, I don't want, I want to get us to the indicator, so I'm not going to, to talk much more about, uh, to go through these in much more detail, but this is an important story when we talk about the, um, Dr. Robert Bullard, who has done a lot of work around environmental justice and is considered to be the father of environmental justice. He, he talks about this term, wrong complexion for protection. And this, um, whether it's uh, race or whether it's class, we see how even, even um, systemically some of these some of these discriminatory um, structural issues are baked into um, practices or policies and protocols. In the aftermath of Hurricane Isaac, um, someone asked Senator Mary Landrieu in Louisiana why it was that the um, levees weren't built up to protect Plaquemines Pla 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 Parish, which is um, largely a, a lower income, a lot of oyster men and, and, um, and fisher folk live there. Why it was that those levees weren't built up like the other levees were in the in the seven years after between Hurricane Katrina and Hurricane Isaac when all the levee fortification work was going on and she, and she said she asked the Army Corps of Engineers the same question and they said that they use um, a formula to decide which levees are going to be fortified and the formula in the formula they apply points to each levee based on what the economic impact would be if it was overtaken so that in and of itself using that as a data point really automatically dismisses the people who are most vulnerable to the impacts of disaster because their property values are lower because of yeah so if it would you know a hundred shacks versus one high-rise um, place where people just go to summer or to winter um, they you know if it was very versus a hundred um, low-income houses where people are are living there every day all day and they have all of their possessions there and so we we have this kind of disparity in who gets protection in terms of even the infrastructure as we see the increase in extreme weather events and then we talk about sea level rise which of course as exacerbates the impacts of storms we have whole nations now that are going to have to move because of um because of sea level rise and already we have um a one community in louisiana the il de jean charles band of the biloxi chitamaca choctaw group that had to, is having to move right now because sea level rise is just Taking, taking over their land. We have a place like Thibodeau, Louisiana, Louisiana, which is losing a football field size of land every single hour due to sea level rise. So pretty soon that area is gonna be uninhabitable as well. In the upper right-hand corner, there's a picture of um, the cabinet of the Maldives Island, which had their um, cabinet meeting underwater to illustrate internally and otherwise that that's where they're gonna be in 20 years. That was in 2009, so now it's, um, it's more like 15 years. And a quote from Noah says that today's flood is equal to tomorrow's high tide. This is how normative it's going to be to have these types of impacts. So when we talk about intersections, um, as we say, it's not just class, it's also race in terms of the impacts. And we also want to talk about not it's not just physical in terms of health, but also mental health. When we have the, the a situation where people are um, are always being racially profiled and always being cast in a certain light and having these types of in, in, in these impacts, we have to think about what the, the uh, mental health um, impacts of these these issues are as well. And so these two um, is, these two um, images really um, define in some way how certain people are regarded in disasters or otherwise, and uh, how other people are regarded. So on the very same day, in the very same context, um, the AP reported these two stories very differently in terms of their language. When it was um, white American folks who were taking um, items from grocery stores, it was characterized as two residents wade mm -hmm. through chest deep water after finding bread and soda from a local grocery store after Hurricane Katrina came through the area in New Orleans. But when it was a person of color, African-American person, it was a young man walks through chest deep floodwaters after looting a grocery store in New Orleans on August 30th, um, 2005. So we see how that difference happens and then how it leads to 
um, criminalization, which which is disproportionately impacts communities of color and low income communities, and and then we see um, with whether it's Freddie Gray or um, or or Michael Brown or others, how that then um, Philando Castile, how that then leads to actual um, annihilation of folks if um, if left um, unattended. And so we also uh, we can go on and on about the gendered impacts of disaster, but one example is um, the, is that women experience violence against women in the aftermath of disaster, whether it's Hurricane Katrina, the BP oil drilling disaster, the earthquake in Gujarat, the earthquake in Haiti. Time after time, it, it all, the statistics always show that women experience domestic violence as well as sexual violence in the aftermath of disasters. If you, we did a report um, after the BP oil drilling disaster and we looked at the police blotters and the reports from the police blotters and found domestic violence in certain areas quadrupling after after the BP oil joint disaster. And then we have this this uh, intersection again of, of uh, we have now these increasing increasingly punitive immigration policies, but yet at the same time, U.S. being the 4% of the global population, but 25% of the um, emissions that drive climate change. And it's really a, a lot of the folks who are immigrating are immigrating because of climate forest migration. They're, they can't find livelihoods in their homes, whether their crops are dying, drying up or, or whether it's disaster that's taking over their land and making it uninhabitable. A lot of this migration is climate-driven migration. This is a quote from Warsan Shire, a, a Kenyan-born Somali poet. You have to understand that no one puts their children in a boat unless the water is safer than the land. And so we see how some of the, the impacts um, that, that drive us from taking the action that we need to take, and some of this is politically motivated, um, even making us deny the existence of climate change and, and stamping out our ability to be able to take the, the actions that we need in terms of policies that we need. As uh, Martin Luther King says, all progress is precarious and the solution of one problem brings us face to face with another problem. And so again, the false solutions, whether it's clear cutting, um, clear cutting forests to, to, to burn biomass or to plant ethanol, um, the false notion of, of, uh, of climate, of uh, population control being the answer, which is again, a reproductive health issue that dis often disproportionately impacts communities of color and low income communities, because it's all often the populations of these, these communities that people are wanting to control the most. Um, and then, you know, false solutions like clean coal and and others. Um, and so moving forward, then we see some of the results of even some of the uh, climate adaptation strategies like gentrification, where, again, communities are being displaced. And even in the after, again, going back to this um, mental health issue, there's a study that just came out two days ago about the farmers who have um, committed suicide as a result of their crops dying up, drying up in, in, in India because of climate change. So as we want to push for the solutions that we need to make to, to address these issues, this is a just transition framework that was developed by the Climate Justice Alliance. And I'm going to hop out of this presentation for a minute to show you the um, document that was referenced earlier by Linda that we came up with called Equity in Resilience Building, Equ Equity in Building Resilience and Climate, Climate Adaptation Planning. And these are some of the vulnerabilities and assets that we need to consider as we think about how we, how we change our systems to 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 route out the systemic challenges um, that 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 make certain communities more impacted than others in the face of climate change so in my remaining two minutes or so I just wanted to show you some of these indicators so again uh, so through the various stories that I've told you we already see how age gender race income employment status um, incarceration people with um, criminal records or incarceration status um, undocumented folks recently immigrants how all of every last one of these um, factors can be um, both a resilience builder in terms of like the cultural um, norms that make these communities um, strong to be able to withstand these challenges because they withstood challenges over the the test of time I um, mean over the test of time for historic marginalization but also just the very fact that that historic marginalization makes these communities more vulnerable to the impacts of climate change um, drive and, and results. And so, so these are some of the basic demographics. And then we go into some of these other um, factors, housing security, food security, mobility, 
health status and systems and services and we really needed to look at Jackie, all of these yes Jackie, excuse me we're only sure. seeing the one slide the strategy framework for just transition so if you're sharing something else we're not seeing it oh wow that's tragic <laughs> okay well um i'm not sure oh i know why but I'm not going to, I mean, I won't, because I'm now I only have like one minute left. So you don't, but folks, hopefully everyone will have access to be able to look up the equity and resilience building for adaptation planning document. And then you'll see all of the indicators that I'm just reading off to you from the document. It, it's really just a list of the indicators that I'm saying to you anyway. So you'll see them all um, if you download that document. And I'll pretty much just wrap up here with, I mean, I think this 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 slide with the just transition, moving away from an extractive economy, really pushing back on the bad, and then building the new, which is a living economy that is based on you know caring, which is based on on um, co cooperation and interdependence among communities. And so I would have given, if we had more time, I would have given me some of the examples of the ways that that's happening. But again, this is just a, a short kind of to tease you guys. And then you'll be able to get more information from the, the information I'll be sharing with you after the, um, after the webinar. So thank you. Thank you so much, Jackie. That was incredible and powerful. Um, and hopefully we can have more discussion of those indicators during the um, discussion period at the end after all three speakers have spoken. Um, thanks for really showing us that the roots of the problems are in the equitable economic um, and social systems that we have and in the inequitable distribution of resources and power and that we really have to openly address racism and other forms of discrimination if we're going to increase resilience to climate change and its health impacts. Okay, and now um, we'll have Gina Solomon speak. And um, uh, Dr. Bornstein, if there are any quick clarifying questions for Jackie, we can um, hear those. And if not, then we'll go to Gina and then Nick and have a more robust discussion and questions at the end. Thank yeah, you. Oh, yeah um, basically folks were asking about that indicator slide that we were Folks were asking about the indicator slide that we weren't able to see at this time, but we will make it available on the website. Um, but there were thanks. no other specific questions at this time. Okay, thanks. Gina. Yes, hi everyone, and thank you. Um, this is such a, a great opportunity to talk about such an important topic. and. Um, so I'm going to be presenting the CalEnviros screen tool, uh, which is something that was developed uh, here in California to um, basically measure uh, environmental justice. That was the challenge that we were trying to meet uh, in, this, uh, in this tool. Um, and so the history of the tool um, is the most recent version, is the, the third version, 3.0, uh, released in uh, January, so a little over six months ago. Um, and uh, it, this tool has been in progress for quite a number of years now with several earlier versions. Um, and it um, is based on uh, not really a climate um, focus, nor on a uh, health disadvantage focus, but really is based originally on an environmental justice focus. Um, however, as you'll see, it becomes very relevant to our climate focus today because of how the tool is being used in California. Um, so, you know, there are um, definitions of environmental justice that look at uh, the, the um, adoption and development and enforcement of environmental laws and regulations. And that also uh, where there's a, a call or a requirement to uh, the California Environmental Protection Agency to identify and address gaps in these programs that impede the achievement of environmental justice. Well, how do you identify and address gaps unless you can figure out a way to measure um, this issue um, in some way? And that um, was the challenge we were trying to face. And in some ways, it's not a new challenge. I mean, going all the way back to the original United Church of Christ report that sort of in some ways kicked off the entire EJ movement in the US, um, the, you know, there's a map right there on the front of the report showing the uh, dramatic associations and concentration of pollution sources in 
low-income communities of color um, and how, um, you know, and then since then there's an enormous scientific literature that has identified associations between socioeconomic stressors and um, worsening of health impacts associated with pollution, uh, including air pollution, lead exposure, many other pollutants. And so we know that there's this cumulative impacts problem. The question is how to measure it. Um, and so there's been a process that's now spanned over 15 years um, with advisory committee recommendations, uh, the creation of a cumulative impacts working group in California, um, and then uh, the development of a, a sort of a conceptual report, a uh, lot of uh, community consultation and workshops, um, and then finally um, these final reports. Here's the report I mentioned before that's the, the conceptual uh, approach to building a scientific foundation to cumulative impacts. And the reason this is important is that the working group that wrote this um, you know, was was representative of uh, you know broad cross section of uh, NGOs, uh, public health uh, folks, um, and and even some industry participants. Um, they identified exposures, public health or environmental effects, sensitive populations, and socioeconomic factors. And so we took that and said, okay, let's try to measure each of those pieces that are highlighted in red here. Um, and so we you know, went into the field, into communities uh, with um, maps and ideas and approaches with a sort of a world cafe format sitting around the table uh, with folks um, around the state and um, heard that, um, that people want it as local a geographic a scale as possible. So at the moment, we're at the census tract scale. We wish we could get finer. Um, so here are the census tracts in California, about 8,000 of them. Each one has about roughly 4,000 people in it. Um, you'll see right away that in urban areas, those census tracts represent a pretty fine scale. But in rural areas, census tracts are very large. And so we don't get a lot of um, really good um, sort of local scale information at the, uh, in the rural areas of California. And so that's a, a disadvantage of the tool. Um, and so looking at those components that were highlighted by the uh, Cumulative Impacts Working Group, uh, exposures, which is contact with pollution, uh, environmental effects, which are basically um, adverse environmental conditions. You could call it almost blight um, or uh, things that basically lower the quality of living in a neighborhood. Uh, sensitive population, so this is health status, asthma being a perfect example here of one of our indicators. Um, and then community characteristics that result in increased vulnerability. And we, we went out uh, asking for ideas and information of criteria uh, that included you know, health relevant, widespread, linked to vulnerability, publicly available, location-based, statewide, current. Uh, it was tricky actually, finding good data sets um, for uh, these indicators. And so um, here are our indicators. Um, for 3.0, we've been um, re removing some, adding others, you know, continually adjusting this, and we will continue to um, tweak and, and improve this tool uh, into the future. Um, we're actually, I'm missing right now a team meeting in which they're talking about potential new indicators to add, some of which are associated with climate change. So it's really um, a, an active process. Um, and so you'll see right away that, you know, if the focus is climate change, there are some indicators, ozone, uh, PM 2.5, uh, potentially drinking water contaminants um, that, you know, are, are climate related. Um, some uh, sensitive population effects such as uh, asthma and cardiovascular disease that are also um, populations at high risk from climate change. And then some of these socioeconomic factors also, um, as highlighted in Jackie's presentation, 
also related with um, vulnerability of climate change. Um, but some of these are really not particularly climate related because this is really not focused on being a climate tool per se. Um, and so uh, we're looking at a whole range of uh, exposures and environmental effects um, in the tool. Um, the indicators, one of the key issues here is we got all these individual indicators and we can map them individually and we can look at them individually, but we wanted to combine them. And so each indicator is assigned a percentile value, uh, basically a grade. Uh, so each tract for each indicator um, gets, you know, a zero to a hundred percent score compared to every other tract in the entire state. Um, so everything is relative here. Um, and um, then it makes it easier when you've got percent, everything uh, normalized to a percentile score, uh, it then becomes possible to start combining them more easily. It also makes it super intuitive to think about, okay, how, here's how we uh, score the whole, um, you know, how this, this tract compares with the rest of the state. We actually did something kind of controversial, which is in calculating the score, we used a multiplier. So we took the pollution burden scores and the population characteristics scores, uh, each of which were sort of added up to, with each other, and then multiplied them because the scientific literature to date suggests that there is in fact a synergistic response, not an additive response between um, the population vulnerabilities and the exposures and, and other um, external uh, threats that the population faces. And so we decided to reflect that in the score. Um, and um, it, I wanna get right into why this is relevant to climate, which is um, shortly after the first version of this tool was created um, and, and workshopped, um, the legislature passed a bill, uh, SB 535, Senate Bill 535, which um, required uh, the Secretary of Environmental Protection in California to identify disadvantaged communities. And the legislation included criteria, and those criteria happened to um, very closely mirror the criteria in the cal existing CalEnviro screens uh, tool. That may not have been a total coincidence. Um, and the, uh, those uh, disadvantaged communities were um, uh, required to be the recipients of 25% um, uh, at least of the greenhouse gas reduction fund expenditures that are raised from the auctions of uh, carbon um, or greenhouse gases in California. And so the investment plan is really focused on trying to spend, you know, significant amount of money in disadvantaged communities. And we have actually far exceeded that 25% um, uh, requirement in the expenditures so far. Um, and uh, the, it, more recently, AB 1550 has piled on top of those requirements to um, include areas within a half mile of a disadvantaged community, and then also some focus on low income areas. Um, and so we have uh, really seen um, not only what we anticipated, which is under using Cal Screen, you know, we were expecting that our, we um, would focus the, the compliance and enforcement, environmental enforcement resources of our agency on these communities to try to ensure that at a minimum um, all of the laws and regulations are being followed by the businesses in these communities and that the community, uh, the environmental quality is as good as possible. Um, and we already had um, allocated um, focus of our environmental justice small grants on uh, uh, organizations working in, in the most disadvantaged communities. But now, agencies all across the government, including the, the California Strategic Growth Council, or SGC, uh, the California Department of uh, Community Services and Housing, uh, the Public Utilities Commission, California Transportation Agency, um, the Fire, uh, Cal Fire, and our Resources Agency are focusing um, their 
uh, you know, funding efforts around a whole series of things that relate to climate, um, both reducing greenhouse gases and also um, resilience efforts um, in uh, the disadvantaged communities identified under Cal Enviro screen. Um, and so um, we're seeing this sort of um, interesting synergy between climate efforts and this particular tool. Um, so what do these maps look like and what do these communities look like? Well, um, this is a static version of the map, but it's much more fun to um, go to the website. And so you can go to the website, which is OEHHA, the Office of Environmental Health Hazard Assessment, OEHA.ca.gov forward slash Cal Screen. And you'll land on uh, the page that I hope you can see on, on your um, screens now. Tina, we're um, still seeing your slide that says results on the map of California. Oh, no. How do I do this? Uh, Stephen and Frank, any help here? Oh, wait. New share. Let me try this. I think I've got it. Uh, Yay, good job. Yay, okay. I had to update the share. Okay, so this is what it looks like. Um, and so you can see the URL at the top, Cal Enviro screen, and it has information about what is Cal Enviro screen, a training video here, information about cum cumulative impacts and environmental justice, um, copies of the maps and the data, um, and um, also information about what we heard at all of these uh, different meetings that we had around the state. Um, there's also information and in navigation bars at the top. If you want to download the data, you can get it in Excel format, Google Earth, ArcGIS, or in a shape file um, at this link. Um, you can um, look at earlier versions and compare them. You can look at individual indicators here. So if you wanted to see um, individual like uh, drinking water contaminants, you can go to that and it will show you. Is it updating, by the way, as I move around? It is. Yay. Um, why the indicator is in here, how we measure it, what data sources, and then you can actually have a live interactive map to look just at that indicator. So if you're interested in just drinking water um, or um, you know, or any other of the indicators in there, you can get that information. Um, and so um, this uh, gives you all kinds of um, kind of information. If you're just interested in the disadvantaged communities identified using Cal Enviro Screen, you can go see those here. And that's just a, a uh, you know, they're all highlighted just in red in a static map. But let's look at the more interactive map, which is 3.0, uh, the current version. Um, hello, there we are. Um, and it shows what's new here. Um, but you can scroll down and you can see the 3.0 map with some caveats. I left the splash screen up. Um, and you can also um, go, whoops, you can click this to open in a new window. And if you open in a new window, you will see the, did it just do that? Yep. I did, so. yes. Yep. Uh, so you'll see the full screen version with each per, uh, a key showing the different percentiles in a kind of an intuitive green to red format and um, the entire state with um, the, you know, all the census tracts. And you can um, zoom in and out or uh, scroll around however you want using your mouse. Or you can just put in, um, let's put in Oakland. Put in a location and it'll zoom you right in. So here's Oakland, California. Um, and you can kind of look around and say, oh, okay, there's a, a zone down here that seems kind of um, like there's a fair amount um, of uh, affected communities. So let's take this little census tract here, click on it, and it will say, okay, there's a, a little over 3,000 people living in this uh, few block uh, radius area. They are in the um, top 10% of census tracts in California. Uh, they happen to be in the 99th percentile for the population characteristics, not quite as high for pollution burden. 
And so let's go down and see. Okay, so not a lot of ozone, only in the eighth percentile for census tract in the state, but look at all the diesel exhaust. And that's because it's really pretty close to the Nimitz Freeway here. Um, and um, sort of, you know, a little bit high in cleanup sites uh, and pretty high here in groundwater threats. So there must be uh, some contaminated uh, you know, plumes underneath that community and also quite high in hazardous waste and solid waste sites. But look, you know, this community is in the 99th percentile of census tracts in the entire state for asthma emergency department visits. 96th percentile for infants born low birth weight, uh, you know, and very high for really all of these other indicators. Some folks have asked us why we include linguistic isolation, and we include that for a number of reasons, but in part, it, it affects political participation and ability for a community to advocate for itself. And it also, in the case of an emergency, for example, a flood or any other kind of emergency event, it may make it harder to reach out um, and communicate with emergency messages to people in that community. And at the bottom of each of these pop-outs for any census tract in California, you can uh, see what the um, race and ethnicity breakdown is for the community. So this community is 68% uh, Latino, 2% um, white, 24% African American, 4% Asian, uh, and 2% other. So that gives you a way to get uh, information very quickly about any census tract in the state and what the breakdown is. And it, uh, there's this little teeny arrow, it's hard to see, but on the uh, next to the pie chart, if you click on that, it'll take you over from race and ethnicity to age. So this is the age characteristic. Um, so, you know, what you're interested in is the vulnerable populations. And this, this tract has 19%, so nearly 20% of people living in this census tract are children. That's important to know about, and it's significantly above the California average of 13%. Uh, so there's a, a significant vulnerable population of children, a much lower percent elderly in this census tract than the California average, about half the... Uh, the average, which may relate to life expectancy uh, differences that we see, uh, unfortunately, across the state. And so this is a quick way to um, navigate to a community in California and get quite a lot of information about that community all at one sort of one-stop shop. Um, and so you can do that. Uh, also, you'll see when you click on the census tract, um, it will show you, oh wait, sorry, I'll click on the side here. Uh, it'll show you the border of the census tract. So you can see some of these are very large census tracts. Uh, this one includes all of Oakland International Airport. Um, and some, like the one I had clicked on before, this little one here is, is pretty small. So there's a, a significant variability in size. Um, and so that's a way to, uh, to, to gather info and to navigate around in this tool. So um, I hope that was useful. I'd be happy to show you more because there's a ton of info on the website, but you can always pull it up for yourself, play around, and be aware that under the About tab, if you drop down to the bottom, it says Contact Cal Enviro Screen. Do not hesitate to do that. Um, the staff actually will check. Um, so if you send them, uh, if you contact them, um, in any possible way, through phoning, through um, their CalEnviro screen email, um, you will um, get a response quite quickly from a member of the technical team, and they will talk you through, answer any questions you have, and you can also join the mailing list here to be on the uh, environmental justice list for California, and, and you'll get updates whenever new information is posted, because that happens quite often. Um, also, there's quite a bit of information on here I didn't point to um, in, in Spanish, and so you can um, get information on the indicators. The publications are all translated, um, and even the maps are available in Spanish. So um, that's uh, just to, to better uh, increase availability. So hope that was a, a useful overview, and I'm also happy to take questions at the end. Thanks, Gina. That was fantastic. Thank you for 
taking us on a tour under the hood of Calenvirus Green and showing us how it demonstrates unfair cumulative exposures, particularly in low-income communities and communities of color. Um, Dr. Bornstein, are there any quick clarifying questions for Gina before we move to Nick? Well, I am going to um, pose this one question that's here, which might be something we want to hold for the end. It, it's a sort of large um, question, but it says, do you know of tools that aren't predictive or looking at indicators of climate-related health impacts, but rather measuring the success of ad adaptation mitigation strategies that address health impacts of climate change? So maybe you want to stew on that, Gina. Um, I actually do have an answer on that, but I'm happy to hold it to the end. It, it's up to you. I'll, I can actually pull up the, the information that I have, but I'm trying to remember where it is. Can um, we save that for the end and you can pull it up in the meantime and then yeah, I better other speakers are, will um, also have quite a bit on, both the, on climate change and also on um, trying to measure the success of climate mitigation efforts in California. So a lot of that is much more nascent. And I bet Jackie's indicators will come in, be relevant to that as well. So we'll move now to Nick Steinberg and come back to that question at the end. Thank you. Nick? Okay, great. Thank you, Linda. And uh, good morning, everyone, or good afternoon, depending on where you are. Um, I'm going to show a couple tools here um, that look primarily at different dimensions of climate exposure uh, and how they intersect with uh, some socioeconomic indicators that are specifically related um, to extreme heat and worsening extreme heat conditions. Um, so just a quick confirmation that everyone can see my screen before I dive in. Yes, thanks. Okay, great. So the first one I'm going to show is a, a bit of a conceptual uh, framework for understanding different dimensions of climate change um, in regards to extreme heat. And then I'll move on to a tool um, that uh, is a bit more applied looking at the, the city of Denver itself um, and uh, relies on the, the same framework to, to really identify hotspots throughout the city. Um, so the impetus for creating the heat and social inequity tool, uh, which you can find and, and, and use at the U.S. Climate Resilience Toolkit, um, was to explore um, essentially what dimensions of climate change may make exposure levels uh, worse uh, across areas, and then what socioeconomic indicators would be useful for understanding what populations might be more sensitive to those changes. Um, so I'm going to actually dive into the tool here and uh, take you through the story um, that um, we're trying to tell here, uh, starting with the exposure indicators first. And a little bit of background on uh, extreme heat and its relation to public health. It's obviously one of the more direct, very apparent hazards um, in, in, in recent history uh, in the last 20 years. Of all the natural hazards um, that we experience across the U.S., extreme heat is responsible for more deaths. Uh, a single event can, can generate thousands of deaths and even more illnesses. Um, for those of us in California, or if you're in Chicago or Philadelphia, um, you might have recent memory of some pretty severe heat waves. So this is a very interesting example of the intersection of um, not only heat and health, but also worsening conditions that may make heat um, um, a bit more dangerous, a bit more frequent, uh, and a bit longer. So I'll go into each of those dimensions here quickly. Uh, so this first map that you're looking at um, looks at the continuous U.S. and looks at changes in the severity of extreme heat uh, at the county level. And the reason we looked at counties was because uh, we had widely available data across the entirety of the U.S. Uh, we had good data and, and we could compare quite easily uh, across counties. Um, and what you'll notice here is that areas that are going to increase in, in severity, meaning the the intensity of the heat and the humidity uh, is going to change relative to a historical baseline. Uh, it's pretty pronounced in areas that are typically cooler climates, uh, areas of the Northwest, uh, some of the coastal counties in California, um, the Midwest and Northeast uh, that do experience occasional heat waves, but on a typical summer day um, are not necessarily uh, intense heat, but um, are also more likely to experience 
uh, higher levels of humidity, uh, which we know with climate change, um, heat waves are going to be often more humid um, due to an increase in moisture content and different air mass levels across the U.S. Um, so these heat waves are really becoming a little more oppressive. Um, so that's one dimension that, that we want to explore alongside the frequency of heat waves. And people often ask, um, what should I be concerned about um, in terms of, of changing frequency, changing severity, changing duration of different climate hazards? Um, and it, it, it really depends. And on hurricanes, obviously, we, we might see less frequent events, but they're going to be more severe. Uh, for things like wildfire, drought, uh, air quality, which are very tied to heat, um, we might see uh, much more frequent events occurring uh, with, with also higher intensity. And the characteristics of these events are also changing. So uh, a very similar story to the last map that I showed, if you look across the U.S., areas that uh, typically aren't accustomed to frequent heat waves are going to be seeing a, a pretty significant uptick in the number of heat waves. Um, some of the mountain regions, the Appalachians, the Tetons, the Rockies, parts of the coastal California area, and then, of course, areas that are also very accustomed to frequent heat waves will see a significant increase as well. Now, this is all looking at the relative change in uh, these type of exposures and these conditions. Uh, but undoubtedly, uh, there are consequences for uh, absolute uh, thresholds of heat when it gets so hot that uh, any human, no matter your acclimation level, um, you're, you're going to be uh, at a higher risk. So we see areas of the Midwest and the South um, crossing this threshold um, that um, is, is very specific to uh, di different heat humidity levels uh, at about 36 degrees wet bulb. Um, you tend to see a very sharp decline uh, in physiological and thermal regulation ability. Um, so we want to look here as well at where these really severe events uh, might occur by mid-century. And then um, all of this is really interesting, but it doesn't say much about public health risk unless we look at uh, the socioeconomic conditions uh, across the U.S. So we're able to really identify what areas are more susceptible um, to, to impacts given these, these changes in exposure. Um, so here, uh, what we did was map a list of highly associated social vulnerability indicators, actually very similar to some of the uh, socioeconomic indicators that, that Linda just showed. Um, or I'm sorry, that Gina just showed, and it's going to be a similar format. What we're doing is looking at the social vulnerability level relative to all the counties across the U.S., um, and we're looking at things such as poverty, race, education, housing stress, uh, prevalence of diabetes, uh, age groups, uh, uh, so specifically elderly groups, um, elderly living alone, and also living alone. Um, and we're looking at that breakdown uh, county to county. And there's some really interesting um, sort of case studies that you can identify throughout the country um, that will we'll show in the final vulnerability map here. But I want to point those out now and just show um, in California here, we have a few counties that rank very high in social vulnerability for certain attributes, whether that's living conditions um, or, or poverty rates. And so when we go to this final score where we actually combine all these vulnerability indicators um, for, for comparability purposes, um, you see that some of these counties do pop up as higher risk, or at least above average across the U.S. And the reason being that um, they're, they're largely uh, higher ranking for a lot of the socioeconomic indicators, but also they have very little experience with uh, this type of, 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 of hazard. They're not accustomed to experiencing Keep hazards on a frequent basis or, or with the type of severity that we're expecting to see by mid-century. Um, so we've used this tool largely as a communication tool. Uh, public health officials at the state level find it very useful for comparing across counties. Um, and you can see the stark differences uh, across the U.S., but it, it can also be very useful to look within the state um, and see where those, those differences might be most apparent. Um, so we've taken this framework and we've applied it to uh, a couple of cities across the U.S. I'm going to show one case study here from the city of Denver, um, where the Department of Environmental Health uh, asked us to identify at-risk or high-need neighborhoods uh, with the understanding that there were going to be experiencing more frequent heat waves. And they also had um, some, some pretty uh, um, significant differences in the uh, demographic makeup across the city, as well as the impervious 
uh, and tree canopy coverage across the city. So they had some urban heat island issues and they wanted to make sure if they were identifying or addressing a particular community, they were able to focus the resources, uh, really identify um, the neighborhoods that were, were of highest need. And for all of you that might work in a public health department, you know resources sometimes can be scarce and you need to focus, prioritize. Um, so that was the intent of this tool. And what we looked at were some, some very similar indicators, um, starting with the built environment, looking at uh, impervious surface coverage across the city, as well as tree canopy. And these two indicators combined um, can show a very compelling story about uh, where urban heat island uh, or where uh, excess heat is, is felt, not necessarily generated, but where it's actually experienced. Um, so we have these areas just west of uh, South Platte River that are old industrial areas, um, largely concrete. And we also have, um, as I'll show here, uh, some very interesting social demographic issues when overlaid in those areas, you see very high uh, association. Um, so looking specifically at vehicle access, linguistic isolation, um, household isolation, all things that during an emergency or during a hazard uh, could be uh, important measures of uh, their ability to, to seek out neighbors, uh, to receive warning information, or to reach a hospital uh, or an emergency care unit if needed. Um, and then looking a little towards some of the demographic groups, we see uh, elderly are concentrated in parts of, uh, of the city. This is largely due to um, some ho um, elderly homes and some higher concentration here in the southeast. Um, we also look at educational attainment due to a high correlation, obviously, um, with income levels. Um, as you'll see here, you see some of the same areas popping up at higher risk, some of the northern parts of the city, some areas that are west, and then a few out towards the airport in Denver. And then, of course, race, um, those same areas um, are, are considered high risk once we get to this final vulnerability score. And then some of the health metrics, uh, things that are highly associated with um, uh, health effects post heat waves. So we took examples from Chicago 1995 heat wave, the California 2006 heat wave, um, and a lot of the individuals that were affected um, either had some sort of ambulatory or cognitive disabilities or were elderly uh, with those same disabilities. And you can see that some of those areas do pop up again. So we have this really high crossover. Um, so part of the process of identifying, well, how do we how do we understand all these indicators uh, in a way that's really useful, um, considering that there's high correlation? So we do um, some statistical analysis through principal component analysis and do some weighting uh, to really identify what's the attributable uh, weight of each individual indicator to a final score so that we can compare neighborhoods uh, across the city. And so this is the final map that you're looking at. Um, and what we recommended was concentrating some resources here in the northern part of the city where you have um, multiple census tracts uh, adjacent to one another that are considered higher risk. Um, and the city itself was actually exploring this uh, neighborhood for their upcoming neighborhood plans for building a greenway and also for some public health outreach plans. Uh, so not only validated um, their decision, but it also helped support um, some of their future funding. Um, so I'm happy to take questions, but um, uh, you can go to uh, the Ponders on this toolkit to explore the first tool, and you can also go to our website uh, to find the second tool uh, covering the city of Denver. Thank you. Thanks so much, Nick. That was really useful, especially to have the climate exposure of extreme heat overlaid with the social vulnerability indicators and having them be um, <clears throat> weighted based on the literature and the evidence. Um, Okay, Dr. Borenstein, should we start with that question that was previously asked for the panel regarding tools for success in measuring um, resilience and adaptation measures? Yep, go for it. Gina, did you want to start? Yeah, I know you have something queued up. Oops, sorry, I was muted. Uh, well, you know, I'm not totally sure if... Um, if this answers the question, because really we've only looked at it in two ways. One is um, indicators of climate change, and so obviously we would hope to see improvement if we see um, lower vulnerability, but I posted um, in the comment bar a link to the 
the um, Indicators of Climate Change report from 2013. Um, and that's more as a teaser because there is going to be a 2017 update that will be coming out in a couple months. But um, so stay tuned. I'm just going to um, share my screen while you talk, Gina, because it has a resources related to that. Yeah, uh, yeah, that could be useful. Or yeah, I have. Okay, you're sharing yours. Good. Um, and then uh, the other thing is that, and this is sort of the flip side, I think, of the question, which is that there has been some concern about um, about unintended consequences from the um, process of capping and trading um, carbon emissions credits, um, which is the way that California has chosen to um, reduce greenhouse gas emissions. And there are concerns that um, that could result in potentially um, increased emissions of both uh, CO2, which we don't care so much because uh, it's a, not a local pollutant, but also of co-pollutants such as particulate matter or um, toxic air contaminants from individual facilities, perhaps uh, ones in disadvantaged communities, um, and so that if it, you know that if cap and trade occurs, there could be um, some backsliding on um, other health measures um, related to air pollution, um, and. Um, so there was a report that looked at that that came out also from OEHA. Um, and if you go on their website, um, oehha.ca.gov forward slash environmental hyphen justice, you'll see all of their environmental justice work. Um, and if you go down to uh, the bottom of that page where it says reports, uh, you'll see the February 2nd, 2017 report on the benefits and impacts of greenhouse gas limits on disadvantaged communities. You'll find it not super satisfying because there's not a lot of data yet. It's too early in the program to really tell whether um, the, the greenhouse gas reduction efforts is increasing or decreasing um, pollution in disadvantaged communities, but they did certainly identify that um, you know 57 percent of um, regulated uh, stationary sources so polluters are within a half a mile of a disadvantaged community in California and it's a lot higher for some of the big sources like 75 percent of refineries are in disadvantaged communities um, and there are some correlations between greenhouse gases as they go up and down and other pollutants so we're going to have to keep an eye on that um, so that's something that is going to be for sure updated and tracked over time. Thanks. So what this screen shows, this is um, a shot from a chart we created um, for the Safeguarding California, California's uh, Climate Change Adaptation Plan. And it just shows different sets of indicators that are being used out there from the environmental justice screening method um, over to the NAACP tool um, that Jackie developed. And um, <clears throat> These are different ways to measure either exposure or vulnerability or, as I'll show you in a second, progress towards achieving resilience for communities. Um, the the um, upper ones here uh, denote uh, hazard prox or proximity to, ha to environmental hazards. And then as we go down, there's health ris risk and exposure metrics, and then social and health vulnerability metrics, um, and more of those in climate vulnerability metrics there, tree canopy and impervious surfaces. Um, one of the uh, sets of indicators here are the CalBRACE, Building Resilience Against Climate Effects project that we have here in our office um, that just put out our reports that were discussed last week. And then here, um, Jackie's indicator set is heavy on the adaptive capacity process and outcome metrics. And these are things like um, is there planning and decision making at the local level that is adaptation specific or public health sector adaptation specific plans or decision making? Um, is resource allocation based on equity? Are um, stakeholders engaged, et cetera? Um, are residents returning or rebuilding to where they were displaced from? Um, are there cooling centers? And so those are some great indicators of resilience. Um, and here's the, some of those social uh, determinants of health that Jackie discussed and others discussed. New jobs created, jobs lost, community
community farms and gardens, access to healthy foods. So I don't know if Jackie, you wanna discuss your tool anymore before we go to the next question. Thank you. Okay, Dr. Warnstein, next question. Oh, okay. Um, so we have a, another data question directed to Nick. Um, if you're, if Nick is familiar with Calbrace, it'd be helpful to understand how the um, how the the tool that he showed and the results compare to indicators that we heard about last week. Sure. Uh, all the indicators and data um, for at least California there are actually from Calbrace. So um, we're taking um, the descriptions of the indicators using Calbrace, repurposing them for the U.S. Um, and we've also applied that on a, a city level for, for areas not covered by Calbrace. Um, but a quick note, uh, Calbrace is a supporting data provider for a tool we are developing for the California Fourth Assessment, uh, which is a decision support tool for public health practitioners to look at uh, specifically um, what areas might be more uh, at risk exposed uh, to oncoming heat waves, and it utilizes um, a majority of all the Calibrate indicators. Um, so as all these projects unfold and, and uh, we're creating new tools uh, between the Cal Enviro screen, Calibrate, uh, so the 427 is creating, uh, we're all sharing data and trying to, trying to remain consistent in making sure that we are using the same parameters for, for all the indicators that we develop. And then there's one additional tool, the Health Disadvantage Index, which, which is also a, a spatially based tool um, based on census tracts, and you can visual it, you can see um, different levels of health disadvantaged uh, uh, in the indicators, and they're actually updating that now, including the Calabrese indicators, and it will be renamed to the Healthy Places Index soon, so stay tuned. And I think we have, we have one um, last question at the moment. Um, comes from Maria saying, we have heard several policies and efforts of the local government to combat climate change. How can we move forward for a successful participation of many to control climate impact effects? For example, advocacy groups in local hospitals for patients impacted. Who would like to take a stab at that? Uh, uh, you know, I will jump in because it, it's sort of related to what I was thinking. This is um, Penny Bornstein from SLO is um, I'm really impressed with the data tools that have been presented today and I'm making all kinds of notes about what I'm going to go and look at and for. Um, and I, I think what I see from today's presentation that is um, the best takeaway is how um, we can marry the data geeks with the policy um, uh, proponents and to, to really drill down at a community level. That's something that's always been difficult to take these sort of broad constructs of, of climate change and who it affects, but to really drill it down to the neighborhood level and then give the kind of stories that um, you know, Jackie presented early on. So I think it's, um, the panel has been really instructive for me and hopefully for this um, questioner as well about um, how you can really um, get detailed information, show your decision makers, your elected body, what have you, what's happening at a really local level. Um, and, and to do so with a mix of data and, and the kinds of um, EJ stories that we've seen. Great, thank you. Gina, Jackie, or Nick, would you like to respond to that? Um, this is Gina. I mean, I just, I think that um, there is so much of, of, I think what we're trying to do at the state level is to, to um, provide tools that local um, agencies and entities can use. And, and so having collaborative efforts at the local level is fantastic. And I, I think 
part of why I'm excited about this webinar series is that there are so many people from um, local uh, governments and local groups that are participating that um, I'm hoping you guys will use this and, and in creative ways where you can um, put some of these pieces together that we're offering and, uh, and, and make some, some good, uh, you know, and inform some good decisions at the local level. Right. But I can't okay. tell you how to do it. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Gina. Jackie or Nick? Yeah, this is Nick. I'll, I'll jump in and just remark on the uh, the truism and, and climate change advocacy that you have to grow your efforts from inside out and uh, starting at a local scale uh, is really is one of the best starting points. Um, and look to stakeholders at a local level that you haven't previously engaged with. Um, you mentioned hospitals in your question. Uh, a lot of public health departments and hospitals don't always talk to each other about these issues. Um, so a great way to sort of engage from the inside is to utilize some of these tools at a local level and identify uh, which stakeholders or which institutions uh, could be more engaged and, and it could be a good uh, partner uh, for having this conversation. Thanks. Jackie? Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, thank you. Yeah, so I was listening. I mean, I really just echo it, what others have said. One of the things that came up recently was with this notion of um, in making sure that communities are engaged and making decisions and, and in the adaptation planning process is there we were um, talking about the need to, to to meet communities where they are actually engaging in their meetings instead of expecting them to come to uh, a separate planning meeting, but then at the same time needing to be sensitive towards in terms of the balance of not having that end up being that there's like community meetings and then there's like the regular meeting. And so then, um, and then what ha what comes up from the community ends up going through a filter when it's discussed at, when these discussions happen at the regular meeting, quote unquote. So just really having to be attentive to what it means to, ha to have meaningful engagement and decision making of, of frontline communities in, in adaptation planning is something that needs a lot of um of deliberation i guess um so thank you that's a sure. perfect note to end on um i just wanted to note that here in california uh, we're working more and more towards integrating guidelines and requirements for um local community grantees local grantees for uh, greenhouse gas reduction fund programs and other programs uh, to really demonstrate a history of robust civic engagement and community engagement at a grassroots level um, in order to receive funds. And so uh, I think the, the trick is, is how, to, how to measure that um, and make sure it's true, a robust public engagement that's accessible to people, like you said, Jackie, um, meetings held in the evenings um, or and having people be paid if possible to, for example, sit on a technical advisory committee providing childcare, food, interpretation, um, having meetings and events um, coincide with other community celebrations or school events where people are already attending. Um, and so that's that. those discussions are underway. And uh, we're out of time. Thank you all so much for your fantastic presentations. Um, I think we all learned a lot about the need to look at these cumulative impacts and really focus on um, inequities such as racism in as they exacerbate vulnerability to climate change. Um, I will now turn it over to Dr. Borenstein to close. Uh, thank you, Linda. And I did one last shout out to you. We got comments about your slide showing the difference between equity and equality. Um, it was a really nice visual and one we all need to keep in mind. Um, as we roll into our next session, it will be continue to be relevant. The, the title of our last fourth session is Innovative Curricula for Public Health Priority Populations. Um, so we'll be taking another look at um, how do you focus in on the highest risk communities 
and to actually look at, um, at teaching methodology. So on August 9th, uh, the next Wednesday, 10 to 11.30 Pacific Standard Time, we will close out with that topic. And thank you to all of our attendees who have participated um, both through watching and, and raising some really um, wonderful questions for our panelists. And thank you to all of our panelists for um, all the work that you do in this arena. So we'll see you next week.